Here we're going to do some examples that will simplify and hopefully help you understand the meaning of the density of the charge in the differential form of Gauss's law. Here we don't have a problem because all we do here is set up a, uh, a Gaussian surface, doesn't matter where the surface is, and all we have to worry about is how much charge is inside the surface. But in the differential form, the equation, we talk about the charge density of the surface. So let's explore that just in a moment. So let's say we have a small sphere like this with radius r, and let's say we want to find the electric field somewhere inside the uh, surface. And so to do that, we can use the, the equation right here. And when we do that, we find out that this is the electric field strength inside the sphere. And then if we go outside the sphere, this will be the electric field outside the sphere. All right, so we're good with that. Now what happens when we take the very same charge and put on a spherical object that's twice the radius and therefore eight times the volume? Well, what we find then is that the electric field strength will not increase as quickly as we go from the center of the circle out to the very edge. And by the time we get to the very edge of the circle right here, the electric field strength at a distance of two times the radius here should equal the electric field strength on this object when we're two radii away. So if we draw a Gaussian surface out here that is two radii away from the center of this object, the electric field strength here should be the same as the electric field strength there if we have the same amount of charge on here as we do on there. And that is indeed the case. And so what we find here graphically is that this is the intersection point for both cases. So the electric field strength right here would be one quarter the electric field strength at one radius for this object. So it would drop off as one over r squared, which makes sense. One over r squared, if r is twice as big, that would be one fourth the electric field strength. And you'd get the exact same result if you have a an object that's twice as big in radius and you want to find the electric field strength at the very edge, you can see that the increase inside the sphere would be much slower at one quarter the rate. And then we get to the very top, they would then intersect here, the electric field strength here would be the same at this location as it would be at this location, as would be at this location if we have all of the charge at a point object at the very center of this Gaussian surface, and the Gaussian surface being two times the radius of this object away from that central point with charge. So in each case, the electric field strength here, here, and here has to be exactly the same because of Gauss's law, we can confirm that. So what are we going to do now to understand this portion better here? Because what charge density do we use in this case, in this case, and in this case, and how does that affect the differential form of Gauss's law? Well, what we're going to do here is take the divergence, and since we're dealing with spherical coordinates, this is the equation in spherical coordinates, but we can get rid of this portion and this portion because if the charge is distributed in a spherical sense and is distributed evenly everywhere, we do not have any variation in the angle theta and the angle phi in spherical coordinates. We only have to worry about the radial coordinates, so we only have to worry about this portion of the equation. So what we're going to do now is calculate the divergence of the electric field inside the sphere right here and see what we get. So for case number one, the divergence is equal to, so this here becomes equal to a one over, and now instead of r, we're going to use the variable a. a is the distance from the center of the sphere to whatever point you want to consider inside the sphere. So we'll use uh, the variable a, so that's one over a squared times the partial derivative with respect to a of a squared times the electric field as a function of the radius, and of course we have that right here, so it would be the um, kq over r cubed times the variable a. Now notice that these are constants, so they can come out the integral sign, so, or not the integral sign, but we don't have to take the derivative of that, so this is equal to 1 over, or not 1 over, but uh, here we have kq over a squared r cubed. So what I did was I took this component right here and put it over here because we don't want to take the differential of that, that's just a constant. And now we have the differential with respect to a of a cubed. Of course, if we take the differential of that, with respect to a, we get 3a squared. And so this becomes equal to 3kq a squared over a squared r cubed. Uh, let's see here. I think we're good. 3a squared kq a squared of r cubed, and then the a squared cancel out, and we're left with 3kq over r cubed. That would be the divergence of the electric field inside this sphere, 
and that would have to equal the charge density of this sphere divided by and divide the by epsilon sub naught. Now let's take the, this portion right here and see if that's indeed equal to this. So let me simplify this a little bit. And of course, k is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon sub naught. So we can write this as 3 times q divided by 4 pi epsilon sub naught times r cubed. And then if you look over there, notice that is the exact same result, except with the 3 down here written up there, but we get the exact same result. So indeed, the charge density here does indeed mean the charge density of this sphere as long as we stay inside the sphere. Now when we do case 2, this divergence of the electric field is equal to 1 over a squared times the partial derivative with respect to a of a squared times kq over, now notice that the radius here is now twice as big as now 2r, so instead of writing r, we have to write 2r, so 2r quantity cubed times a, and of course we can get kq and 2r quantity cubed, we take that in the front because we don't need to take the partial derivative of that because they're just constants, so here we end up with kq divided by a squared, and then 2 cubed is 8, and r cubed is simply r cubed, times the partial derivative with respect to a of what's left here, which is a squared times a, which is a cubed. So we have the exact same thing as we did before, but instead of r cubed here, we have 8r cubed, and of course, if we work that out, this will therefore be equal to 3kq times a squared, because the partial derivative of a cubed with respect to a is simply 3a squared, so we have 3a squared divided by, we have a squared 8r cubed, and notice the a squares cancel out, and we're left with 3kq, or, matter of fact, let's even make it simpler, since k is 1 over 4 pi epsilon sub naught, we can write this as um, 3q divided by 4 pi uh, epsilon sub naught, times r cubed, but don't forget we still have an 8 in the denominator, so it's 1 over 8 times that. And notice, this quantity right here was equal to the charge density of the small sphere, and 1 8 of that is equal to the charge density of the large sphere, because notice when we calculate the density, the charge density of the large, large sphere, we have 1 8, the charge density of the small sphere. So again, what happens here is that the density right here, again, refers to the density of the spherical object right here, and since we have one eighth of the density, we found out when we take the divergence of that, of the electric field inside this sphere, we get one eighth the density of the charge relative to this one. So everything seems to work out just fine. Now what happens when we do this right here? Because now we have a point object, and the charge density is almost infinite, right? Because we have Q divided by the volume. If the volume goes to zero, we have almost infinite charge density. How do we deal with that? Well, it turns out, to make this equation work, to make the divergence of the electric field work in a situation where you're now outside the charge, what you have to assume now is that this small amount, of, well, this not small amount of charge, but this charge over this very small volume is actually distributed in an imaginary sense over the entire volume of interest, in this case the Gaussian surface, what's included in the Gaussian surface. So this charge now, imagine it to be distributed over this entire region, and if you want to find the electric field strength over here, relative to a point charge there, you simply assume that this same charge is distributed all over the sphere, and you then end up with something that looks exactly like that, so that the electric field strength here will be exactly the same as the electric field strength there. So what we can then conclude is that this charge density in the differential form of Gauss's law really means that you take whatever charge you have inside this Gaussian surface and evenly distribute it everywhere so that you find the electric field here exactly the same as the electric field there. And then the differential form of Gauss's law works out. That's something that not a lot of people indicate or, or explain, but in, interestingly enough, if you do it that way, this works. If you don't, this equation will not work, so that's the way it was meant to be used, and that's what Maxwell was envisioning when he thought of the differential form of Gauss's law. And that's how you do that.